Hello and welcome to On the Same Page, a new series of intergenerational conversations by Changing the Narrative Colorado, a partnership of Next 50 Initiative and the Rose Community Foundation. I'm your host, Dominic Dizzuti. Thank you so much for joining us. I am joined today by a very diverse group of people to discuss the challenges and opportunities of staying socially connected while physically distancing. Allow me to introduce our panel today. Aaron Berg, Regional Marketing Director of Volunteers of America for Colorado, Arizona, and Nevada. Christine Burroughs, Director of Older Adult Services at Easter Seals of Colorado. Aaliyah Cook, a sophomore at Emory University. Perla Gaylor, Director of the Denver Office on Aging. Stephanie Knight, Executive Director for the Senior Hub. Bob Murphy, Colorado State Director of AARP. Phil Nash, Executive Director of Boomers Leading Change. James Roy II, Executive Director of Park Hill Collective Impact. And Sylvia Solis, Evaluator and Focus Group Facilitator at Joining Vision and Action. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Uh, I'm very excited to be uh, part of this program with all of you. And this really promises to be a lively conversation. Let's start with our first question. And Bob, I'm going to start with you. Some recent studies have found that younger people are lonelier than those later in life. Does that surprise you? What are your thoughts? We start with a, a distinction we draw at AERP between social isolation and loneliness. So social isolation is a more objective measurement that's defined by the size of your network, friends, family, and that sort of thing. And it's something that can decline over time with the death of a spouse or if you're a family caregiver or you, you retire. And certainly in these extreme cases we're seeing during the pandemic of uh, a nursing home situation. Um, loneliness, on the other hand, is a little bit more subjective. And that's when f people feel a lack of connections or companionship. So while some studies we did earlier this year showed that 43% uh, of adults age 60 plus felt lonely, given that definition, uh, lack of connections or companionship, it's not surprising to me or to us that, uh, that younger folks are, are feeling this very much during these days of physical distancing. That's a good point. Phil, let's go to you on this one. Um, what have you found when it comes to people feeling lonelier, especially the studies that show younger people feeling lonelier nowadays? What's your take? Well, I, I think that I will look at this from a personal perspective, and that is that an older person has had more time throughout life to collect people. Um, I know that uh, people that I worked with 35 and 40 years ago are still in my life. People who are my neighbors 25 and 30 years ago, some of them are still in my life. Uh, different organizations that I vol volunteered for, some of those people are still in my life. So I find myself at this stage of life uh, having actually more people that I want to reconnect with than feeling lonely at all. I have kind of this large inventory of, of friends. And I think that that's probably true for anybody who's been in the workplace for, um, workplace or neighborhood or in a congregation for a long time. Younger people um, probably have moved around more and have are less settled. Older people, when they become more settled and have collected more people, perhaps that explains why we're less lonely. Phil, it makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, Aaliyah, let's go to you as this is part of a very diverse group of people. I'm excited to get your take. Uh, you're currently a sophomore at Emory University. Uh, Aaliyah, what, uh, when you hear studies like this, what's your take? Well, it's honestly not surprising to me. And I feel that a lot of young people may have a harder time being open and vulnerable with one another. But also young people, especially as young as I am, are constantly going through big life changes. Uh, I just went to college a year ago. I moved halfway across the country and I've kind of had to start over with an entirely new group of friends and a new community. So I understand how a lot of young people can feel lonely, especially when they feel like they don't really have roots anywhere. That makes a great deal of sense. Sylvia, I would love to get your thoughts on this, uh, the study about younger people, and then uh, your take of where you're at and, and what are your thoughts? Yeah, so I will echo uh, what Phil said and Aaliyah saying that I think for younger people, there is not that much of a connection yet to the place 
where you're at. So people moving around and not being established in the neighborhood or your workplace, um, it's harder to find those more deeper connections with others so that you don't feel lonely. I think social media also plays a big part. I think at least, you know, my own experience, I think you have a lot of connections, but um, they're not truly all of them, your friends, right? So in times of need, in times of crisis, like we're going through now, um, it's harder to find those deeper connections that you can actually rely on because you're more used to relying on social media for that, those kinds of connections that I don't think are the same. Christine, I'm very interested in your point of view on this one, especially as you hear the different comments so far. There's elements of just life experience, and there's this whole uh, different concept of social media, and frankly, just the fact that every part of a generation of a society has things that are similar, but also goes through things differently. Uh, when you think about this and these studies that show that younger people are lonelier, uh, what is on your mind? Um, I'm so glad that Sylvia brought up uh, the social media aspect because that's something that I've been thinking about a lot. And um, So I'm 28 years old and I have grown up with this influx of technology and, and this big boom of this technological ecosystem. And um, I think as we become a busier society, um, I know I, I'm always busy with work and trying to get dinner on the table and, and other activities that I've committed myself to, it's a lot easier for me to scroll through Instagram or, or Facebook on my phone um, and, you know, check in with a friend there versus calling them up and saying, hey, like, let's go to dinner, or, you know, perhaps now let's have a Zoom, a Zoom happy hour. But um, it, I think it's been hard to carve out time to create those connections. And, and I think that's what a lot of people are, are seeing as we are busy and moving around and, um, you know, things like, like what Olio was saying is, is forming new connections. And so I think that has been difficult for young people and, and older people as well. That's a good point, Christine. Perla, let's wrap up this question with you. When you hear about these studies and the different takes we've heard from around the panel so far, uh, what are the thoughts that occur to you? Well, on a personal note, I think that, you know, people are having children older. So I'm one of those people. I have a young son who's 10. He's an only child. Um, he doesn't live near his grandparents. I actually grew up with my grandparents. Um, I, you know, my family gatherings were very large. I had 50 first cousins where we were always together, where my son doesn't have any cousins near him. So I think we're growing up in different generations where my grandparents were everything to me. Um, there was a lot of respect. There was a lot of, uh, you know, listening to their stories and taking on their traditions and, and carrying those forward. Whereas now I think kids are social media. It's, you know, more of uh, not that one-on-one -on -one interaction, but more on that, as uh, Christine said, social media. Um, whereas, you know, I think as uh, Phil said, I, I have my friend that since I was 12 that I still see on a regular basis. So I agree with what the panel is saying. Um, you know, our lives have changed so differently where I think, you know, what is my son going to look like in 25, 30, 50 years um, that he didn't grow up like I did with, with the family and, and, and constant people uh, surrounding him. So I, I agree that our, our children are young people are lonelier. I think that there's a lot of um, technology and social media that's part of that. And the real value of relationships is missing. And the real respect and value of our older adults is missing. And, and so I try to instill that in my son, even though we don't live near his grandparents. Really, I love all the various points you made, uh, especially about the cousins. I think about just that. My, I didn't have 50 first cousins, but mm -hmm. I have uh, quite a few. But I remember seeing them quite a bit as a kid. It seemed that there was always a birthday party to go to, even I think until we were all teenagers. Uh, my nephews go through a very different situation. They, they love the family just the same, but it's just a, a, it's a different scenario. And every, seemingly every generation goes through those different changes. Let's move the conversation forward to uh, dealing with more of what we're all dealing with as a society, really as a world right now, which is all the physical distancing needs uh, during this uh, COVID-19 crisis. 
Specifically, I want to go to you, uh, Stephanie and Aaron. How has the, the physical distancing of COVID-19 affected younger and older people? Stephanie and Aaron, you both work in organizations providing direct services to older people. Uh, what kinds of effects have you seen? Stephanie, we're going to start with you about the kind of effects you've seen from this physical distancing. Yeah, well, thank you. It has been um, pretty difficult on a lot of our older adults from a program aspect. As you said, we do essential service. So one of the services we provide is Meals on Wheels, and we're used to being in those homes and crossing those thresholds on a regular basis when we deliver meals, and that's all been suspended. So we do see some increased anxiety with our older adults, some fear about the loss of connection and just those checkpoints and companionships that we had in service delivery that they're not getting right now, um, as well as our home care services programs where we were in the home on a regular basis, providing a lot of light housekeeping and other chore work. So we've just really worked hard to reach in as an organization, as a lot of community partners have, and do some things a little different. Um, reassurance calls. We make regular calls to our older community. Um, we also have started something called a Well Elder Program, where it's a network of nine community members that will perform calls of reassurance, companionship, and resource sharing. Um, and in terms of our older, um, our younger adults that interface with the older adults in the program, they have become, again, more savvy and working with us our older adults and really getting them on teams, working with them on Zoom, sharing different tips and tricks with them to engage virtually. So that's been great to see because that feeds them on both sides. And that way we really anticipate, you know, post COVID and life will get back to normal or a new normal and some semblance of normal that they're going to have a higher participation and adoption of technology, which has been one of our goals at the Senior Hub. So that's exciting. So we're seeing that kind of increased connection. Well, I, I love hearing that, the whole idea of an increased connection, this kind of situation is wonderful to see. Uh, Aaron, let's go to you. You work with Volunteers of America. As you look at this, uh, how folks are dealing with physical distancing, and specifically with the organization you work with, what are you seeing? Thanks. Uh, I have seen a lot of the same similar things as um, Stephanie mentioned, and social isolation is very difficult. Um, for anyone, but especially, you know, for our most vulnerable population. And over here in Western Colorado, uh, you know, we have rural area um, and we're, we're very spread out. And with our residents who live in congregate settings, um, you know, they really had to depend on our staff to become their surrogate family and to help um, help them through this uh, this difficult time of not being able to see other their family members in in person since those visits have been restricted at this time, um, and the staff has really risen to the occasion and has provided tremendous support, um, reassurance, and validation to our older adults in our uh, congregate settings. Um, I've seen in the greater community where older adults here are, you know, are living still in their homes um, and they are definitely needing better communication models where they have someone that they can trust to get good information from. If you're, you're you know, you're not necessarily skilled in, in internet or social media um, as an older adult and you, you may not even subscribe to the newspaper since budgets are tight. And so they're looking for, you know, that source, that that person or that organization they can trust to get good, reliable information so that they feel safe and uh, that they know that the community is out there uh, supporting them. We've done things like uh, making calls as well um, on a regular basis, a weekly and daily basis, just the well check to make sure um, the ones that we serve in the home are are safe and, and whatever they might need that we can provide to them. Um, so it's been um, um, a very uh, challenging, but um, also uh, an opportunity to explore the, the things that we need to improve upon and ways that we can provide better support and communication to all of our older adults um, here in rural Colorado. I love that the opportunity is coming up as something that is looking to something how it, how it can be improved. I think it, that that makes sense. There's a, a first of the kind of the reaction, the immediate reaction to all this, and now it's okay. 
we're, we're in a different place. Now we need to figure out how to improve. And I'm loving that you and your organization are figuring that out. Uh, Aaliyah, I want to go to you as a sophomore at Emory University. Uh, you had an entirely different situation. I remember uh, being a sophomore in college a long time ago, uh, but just trying to figure, I, I felt like I was just getting my rhythm that second semester of a sophomore year. Yours was completely turned upside down between campus lockdowns and everything else moving out or staying where you were at. Tell us about your experience of interacting with others, of how to handle the physical distancing needs of this current crisis. Well, it was definitely very challenging to have to abruptly move out of my dorm room. I was actually on spring break when I got the news that I had to fly all the way back to Atlanta, pack up my stuff and leave and start online school. So I think it's been very challenging for all of my peers to start online school when we were promised kind of an in-person education. Uh, I think we've all coped with it by trying to reach out to one another. I talk with my friends on the phone, usually multiple times a day or every day. We've had Netflix watch parties. We do trivia nights, cooking classes. We've tried to stay connected, uh, but it is challenging because we all had to come back home when we were all getting really excited to live on our own. So I think we've just been really trying to support one another and try to stay as connected as possible. Makes a lot of sense. It's certainly a, a challenge. Hopefully you can make up for the, the time lost uh, next year. We'll keep our fingers crossed. James, you work with both younger and older people. What kind of changes have you seen over the last two months and the different ways of adapting the folks you work with uh, in this current environment? Yeah, it's um, it's been interesting. You know, the, the there's definitely a lot of challenges, but there's also been a lot of uh, hope and really encouraging things that have happened in the last couple of months. Uh, through through uh, the engagement work, and so you know, for example, I've I've worked for, with uh, with kids as young as sophomores in high school, all the way to folks in their seventies, trying to uh, connect and, and engage community and understand the needs and experiences of what's going on right now, so that we can uh, uh, work as a collective to improve those things. Um, you know, and one of the things that I would say is in the in the challenges realm, it's very different. On the uh, if you're talking about younger versus older, there are uh, still, of course, challenges on both sides. Uh, for the for the folks on the older side of things, you know, the, I think I've seen some challenges in the technology and and being able to even when you're we're talking about different brands, when you're talking about Zoom versus Google Meet or whatever else you want to use, uh, that there can be some frustration in adapting to one of the brands and changing. And I, I've seen that. A number of times uh, with folks I've been engaging with in the last couple of months. On the younger end of things, it's it's there's not as much of a barrier uh, for the technology uh, piece of that, but it's about really convincing uh, some that it's it's worth their time. It's something that we should be doing is connecting online and, and figuring out how to uh, to really you know better the community in the ways that we we have uh, agreed to as an organization and as a community together. Uh, so, but on the the last thing I'll say is that uh, I have a lot of hope, a lot of uh, really encouraging things that I've seen out of these last couple of months with the folks that have wanted to connect and engage online. There has been a a, a just a, a really great um, a surge of of uh, passion and hope and and connection, and I've seen that span the generations uh, on the online talks that we've had, and so that's. That's a piece that I really have loved to see, and it's been great and hopeful. James loved a, a variety of points you made, uh, specifically the last one about hope. I think as a natural optimist, and I know optimists around me, it's uh, it's a more challenging environment than usual, but that, that hope is a necessary ingredient. I'm glad you're seeing it with the community that you're working with. And I also love the point that you brought up about the, the various technologies. I know just the trying to get together for my sister's birthday uh, just uh, about six weeks ago, uh, figuring out the different technologies. Well, mom and dad were fine on Skype, but my brother's computer worked better on Zoom. And then I had a WebEx thing. It was, we figured it out, but it has certainly uh, brought a whole different new challenge. Uh, let's get into a, a new part of the conversation, uh, looking at the health effects of being so isolated and feeling lonely. Uh, Christine and Stephanie, I want to go to you. Christine, first. When you're looking at this, why is physical isolation potentially so damaging? Well, I'm really glad that Bob brought up the difference between the social isolation and the loneliness piece, um, because I think that's, that's an important piece to discern when we're looking at the research. 
Um, so there's a really awesome study that came out of Vanderbilt um, talking about the health impacts of both loneliness and social isolation and um, the mental health impacts are a little bit easier to unpack as to why people who are reporting more loneliness might be, you know, have less uh, self-esteem or more um, high rates of depression, et cetera. That's, that's a little bit easier to understand. One of the really interesting pieces about some of the research that we've seen come out of the loneliness um, and social isolation research is that it really does actually affect your physical genetics as well. Um, so people who are reporting more loneliness also have been found to have more inflammation in their cells. Um, and so while inflammation in the short term isn't necessarily a horrible thing, in the long term it can have really lasting chronic health impacts. Um, so people who are reporting loneliness for long periods of time are also correlated to have um, chronic health disease or chronic diseases and, and chronic health impacts. So that's a, a really important thing to take a look at um, as far as like sleep quality, um, diabetes, heart disease, those are all correlated with loneliness. And if we have, now that we've identified that those are all correlated with loneliness, we can start to tackle um, strategies to combat those. I think it's a really important part of the conversation that there's some long-term actual health issues when it comes to uh, feeling lonely and this sense of isolation that can happen to so many different people for a variety of reasons. Uh, Stephanie, let's also go to you. Your take on uh, why loneliness and uh, the isolation, what, what kind of damage that can do and what we need to do about it. Yeah, I think I'll just piggyback on a couple of sentiments of the, the er earlier panelists. Again, we see with a lot of the older adults that are in our program or actually that volunteer, we have volunteers that are well over their 60s in um, the, our programming. And what's really been hard for them is the interruption in their routines, you know, their usual recreation where they go probably work out in the morning, they meet at a coffee house with a friend or a peer, and then they come in and have a volunteer experience or, or do something in our agency. So all of that has really been disrupted. And so you can see that there is, um, again, there are some cognitive changes in the sense that people just don't feel as purposeful. They don't feel as motivated. They don't feel as energized because their network of connection and purpose and direction on a daily basis has kind of been suspended. And then with program participants or older adults that may have already um, underlying health issues, the fact that they are not um, conducting their regular activities or having those multiple connections with friends or church members or other peers of the same age can lead to more sitting, more TV watching, more inundation of negative um, you know, media related to COVID. So it really gets in their head and their physical beings, as uh, the uh, panelists said earlier, and really makes them sick or they don't feel as well. They don't feel healthy. They don't report as being healthy. So again, it just kind of touches them in multiple forms, this disconnection and pulling back from everyday connection that they've had and built over a lifetime as one of the panels referred to earlier. That's a lot of network and connections and support that it kind of moved away at one time. And then of course there's the constant underlying fear that we know because the media has talked about older community being disproportionately affected. So then if you always feel like, you know, if I do go out or resume some normal activities, go to the grocery store, you know, am I going to come home sick? Do I want to be sick? Do I want to bring this sickness to anyone else? So that always plays as a tape or a loop over and over. So that also affects well-being because you almost feel like you're just going to catch something when you have a contact with someone else. So a lot of different ways in which they're feeling um, lonely, isolated, socially disconnected, and they are impacting mental health and physical health. Uh, stress has been a problem across uh, generations for a long time, well before this crisis, but this is magnified in certain areas. We talked a lot about the realities of the situation. We can't get away from those, but I really like the idea that we have a, a both a diverse group of people on our panel today, but also a very positive group of people. And I want to get into some of the progress being made, the new uh, ways that we're actually pursuing some hopeful, some uh, progressive ideas. And I think this really stretches across our entire spectrum of panelists today. Uh, let's talk a little bit about specifically the strategies for connecting. Uh, some of you on our panel have converted your in-person conversations and workshops to online presentations. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about that. James, let's start with you and your Park Hill Talks and your community conversations. Tell us more about that. Yeah, um, so yeah, we've been hosting Park Hill Talks for 
uh, almost two years now in the, in the uh, Park Hill neighborhood and have really relied on it being really strong in-person contact and, and, to, and to really ho host those conversations in places that uh, make people feel comfortable. For example, in homes, uh, barbershops even, and churches and, uh, across, and other religious institutions across the, uh, the community. Um, you know, it, when this all changed so fast, it was really about, you know, figuring out how to adapt and how to bring what we had in person online. And now the technological tools are there to do so. Um, but I think the, the, the debate would be that whether or not it's actually effective in, uh, in making someone feel like they are, uh, you know, that, that same experience of being in person. And so what we've really been able to do is, is, is change the, you know, bring, connect uh, the community online in the same way, but, but really change the way that we're facilitating, making sure that things don't just dive straight into business or straight into uh, something that, you know, that uh, we really need to accomplish. It's really about understanding how people feel, uh, having, a, you know, a, a nice, easily facilitated conversation. And uh, that has proved to be pretty effective in, uh, in, in being able to, to have that connection still uh, go. I don't know, I, I mentioned it earlier in the show that I've been um, able to connect different generations and I've been very encouraged by that. Um, the last thing that I would say on, on this is, you know, I, I've been able to, uh, I held, held a training, a Zoom training online for a, uh, a staff of an entire nonprofit organization to be able to, um, to uh, also continue their community engagement efforts. I think as we, you know, as we sit in this realm where it's to, to uh, show love and to show uh, care, you have to be socially distant, that we have to, that we, we need to find these ways to be creative on that uh, social distance. And um, while we're, you know, it, it, as soon as we're ready to get back into things, that feeling and everything that we've done to stay physically socially distant will finally be able to uh, manifest itself and, and some real change and some things that will uh, hopefully bond the community in a very different uh, way. James, I think you hit on a very good point. I know um, I've been fortunate, feel very lucky to be able to work from home, but I know what I've missed is just the, the kind of non-meeting conversations I would have with colleagues, just catching up with how their kids are, how they're doing. Um, and when you see them face to face, you can kind of tell, hey, is something wrong? Or, hey, you seem really excited. Uh, just going to a meeting being very productive, you lose an element of that. I'm, I'm very happy to hear that within your community talks, you found a way to get into some people's feelings and that, that next step. That's great. Um, Phil, let's talk to you about what you're doing with your organization, uh, Boomers Leading Change. Uh, great title, by the way. Uh, but tell us more about the uh, workshops that you've been able to convert. Well, I, I want to just point out something that Dominic said. Perhaps for many of us, the most uh, important social interactions that we've had are with our uh, teammates at work. And one of the things that we've implemented for our staff is every morning we have what we call the Zoom huddle. Uh, we get on the, at 9, 10 every morning, we get on for what we say is going to be a 10 minute huddle and it sometimes goes 30 minutes. But it is all of us catching up with each other on where we are with our work and also uh, some of the banter that you described that is uh, often so enriching. But programmatically, we have uh, started a number of different things. For one thing, we recently put on a, a, a join, join some other people, join some new people and go to the opera. Uh, and we have a, we had a, um, an expert on opera who were, who introduced the opera to our Zoom audience. The audience then went and watched the opera and then after the opera came back and talked about it. Uh, we also have a weekly program called uh, coffee, tea, and BLC, BLC standing for Boomers Leading Change. Uh, and it's kind of a little uh, online salon once a week. And we pick a topic, we announce the topic, and it ranges everything from, uh, you know, how are you dealing with, uh, with social isolation right now to what was your favorite car? Uh, what, was your, what was your most unusual job? And it gives a chance for people to get together and tell stories about their own lives, and uh, it's very enriching. 
We've also done some, um, some more, some work with um, uh, a group of ours, uh, our fellows. Uh, uh, we have a, a fellowship program and these fellows are uh, getting trained in a nationally certified program called um, Aging Mastery. Uh, so we, we're, we're, we have very quickly switched to uh, what we call the Boomers Leading Change Zoom Studio. And, um, and we're bringing people online and teaching people how to uh, interact in this, in this fashion. Well, Phil, that's a great point. And uh, I, I love the different ways that you've been able to encourage uh, banter. Sylvia, let's go with you, with your work with Joining Vision and Action. Uh, what are you doing to connect people in a whole new way? Yeah, thank you. So my work entails all sorts of facilitations focus groups, interviews, facilitated meetings, and I do this with a variety of groups. So very diverse population groups and communities ranging from, um, you know, teenagers to older adults to immigrants, Spanish-speaking immigrants, and, you know, all sorts of different, um, you know, population groups uh, whose voices are not otherwise very easily heard. So in this context of COVID-19, I think it's important to recognize that as facilitators, we're going into people's homes. As we do these things online and virtually using Zoom or other platforms, we're going into people's homes usually. And you know, the context and the conditions are different to what they would be if we were to meet in person in a neutral way, which, which is what we usually did prior to this. Um, so there are distractions. There, you know, maybe children at home or pets and, you know, there's noise and all sorts of other distractions. And we have to take all of that into account. You know, we need to build the space to allow for that to happen as part of the scripts and to take that into consideration as part of the dynamics with the facilitators and with the members of any given group. Um, I actually think this is a great opportunity. It allows for a greater level of intimacy of, or reliability uh, to be used to really connect in a more personal way. So I am also at home. You know, I've been working from home in the past couple of months. I have a toddler and I have a dog who is a, a puppy still. So, you know, there's noise at home and there's distractions and, and she comes in and out of, um, you know, camera when I'm doing some meetings um, or facilitations. And I, I think that um, the setup is not ideal and it's okay. It's okay because we're human, because I think people are going through something that is difficult and acknowledging that things are not the same and that it's okay if there's distractions and if things are not perfect allows for a more genuine connection with them. Um, you know, my work as a facilitator and in community engagement is to create the opportunity and the space for people to voice their opinions and their experiences and to provide suggestions for things that men, may benefit them, you know, moving forward. And I think when you allow for that kind of space and that trust, it yields a better connection. And, and from that, I think there's, you know, a more real way to relate to people to really hear and listen to what they're saying, you know? So, so I think it, it is beneficial in that way, in spite of a lot of the things that have had to change. Um, since this, you know, new environment um, we've, we've had to deal with. That's a good point, Sylvia. And I'm glad you've been able to find so many different options that have worked uh, for your folks. Bob, let's go to you and your work with AARP as its state director. I got to believe AARP has always found different innovative ways to adapt to what's going on in our society. Uh, what are some of the things that you're seeing with AARP that you've been a part of? Sure, Dominic. I can quickly talk about three efforts that AARP has undertaken within the last uh, couple of months. First, going back to that, that nursing home situation and with the appropriate restrictions on, on visitation, something that we advocated for uh, within the industry at the state level and the federal level was uh, virtual visitation alternatives for residents in nursing homes. So loved ones either uh, by, by iPad or something or, or uh, other means can can have uh, daily or weekly contact with their loved ones who are in the congregate care facilities. Secondly, we had this sort of uh, nationwide, we have 50 state offices and we had this independent and simultaneously gr gr uh, simultaneous groundswell uh, when the crisis first hit of, of being really worried about folks who may be isolated at home. 
and we quickly set up a national uh, uh, network of call centers we call the Friendly Voice Virtual Call Center. And in a very short time, like less than a week, we, we recruited almost a thousand volunteers who, who make very regular calls to folks who otherwise might not have ways to communicate uh, as much with the outside world. And then finally, of course, we, we have almost 700,000 members here in Colorado. We'd like to provide them with a great experience. And a lot of that is at live in-person events, concerts and festivals and movies for grownups and that sort of thing. We can't do that anymore. So we have gone to the same kind of virtual platforms that some of the other panelists have, have mentioned. We've had uh, a lot of webinars uh, providing resources and information for our members, who of course are all 50 plus. Um, and, and we've had uh, uh, some elected officials on to learn about what they're doing. And of course, a lot of uh, experts and panelists uh, to help folks um, enhance their, their physical, emotional, emotional and mental well-being. So we've adapted uh, quickly, I think. Well, keep up the same theme of actually, you know, how are we connecting folks? What, what are the connections out there? Perla, I want to go to you. You're with uh, Denver's Office of Aging. You started Denver Connect to reach older people who weren't necessarily online. What are you doing now with that? You know, um, Denver Connect was a real game changer for our office. I felt like um, Denver Connect was a mobile resource fan uh, that was a pop-up office, if you will, that was going out into the community, it was going to events, we were uh, giving information, resources, services to people. We probably connected over 2,500 people in nine months of 2019. And I really felt like we were making, um, you know, we were making that gap smaller of people accessing, older adults and their caretakers accessing information that um, they couldn't otherwise access um, maybe they couldn't get to Denver Human Services, or maybe they just didn't know about a service that was out there in the community. And so we really felt like we were uh, filling that gap. And then COVID happened. And as you know, everything changed. Um, and in trying to stay positive, um, you know, we've, we've been doing a lot of different things. But one thing that I wanted to mention um, with the census going on and being uh, proactive because older adults seem to be undercounted for the census and you know that financially has financial impact on our older adult community and the services that they receive and we want to continue to do that. Um, we uh, Montbello is one of those areas where older adults have been undercounted and most of the vulnerable populations and so we did a virtual census bingo if you will and uh, connected with uh, Councilwoman uh, Stacy Gilmore, and we got older participants to call into Zoom, and we played bingo, and we took pause and talked about how important the census were and, and why everybody needed to fill out the census and how could we help uh, older adults fill out the census and could people, you know, contact us if they had questions on filling out the census. And we really felt like, it was so positive. We gave out some prizes, some gift cards for older adults to go to uh, the store and, and buy the things that they needed. Um, but everyone left that conversation smiling and a little more educated about the census. And I think that really is what we're trying to do now. I think listening to the other panelists is we're still trying to inform, we're still trying to provide services and resources. And we're doing that in a different fashion now, but we still want to be positive and, and connect with an older adult. And recently I had an older adult call me from a nursing home who was very upset about being in her room the whole time. You know, before they could congregate and go to lunch together and they would see their neighbor and they would be able to say good morning or let's, you know, go read the paper or have a cup of coffee, as another panelist mentioned, and now they're in their rooms and they're getting their meals in their rooms and they're not being able to have visitors and that human touch. And I think we, we must have talked for, well, she must have talked to me for about 20 minutes. And then I, you know, kind of gave her some resources to reach out to um, Denver Public Library online or, you know, spark uh, the kind conversations that they're doing. Um, and she thanked me for just listening to her and for having a conversation with her and, and really just being there. And I think that's so important um, to 
be there, to be present, to listen, and then to help with any resource that you can give that might help this person feel like they matter. And so to me, I get kind of acclimated, but I, you know, I, I really feel like we're seeing more and more of that now during COVID. And so we really have to make a special, you know, initiative to, to make sure that we're listening and that we're problem solving and that we're able to connect, to humanly connect with people who really need that. I think it, very, it makes a lot of sense that you're a little bit about that. It's a, it's a sensitive but important part of what I think a lot of different folks and really everybody in this panel is working on trying to increase those connections. Uh, Aaron, I want to talk with you about how you're connecting older people in your communities to families and other folks, but may not be uh, have access to online technology. That's certainly a situation for all, a lot of communities on the rural areas of Colorado, which it's a very big state, a lot of small towns facing broadband issues. And frankly, online access is not 100% for everybody. It's easy to take for granted. So how are you making that work with uh, older people and uh, their families and other communities where you're at? Yes, thank you. Well, pre-COVID, of course, families could come in anytime and visit with their loved ones um, and weren't you know, needing the internet connection to do that. Um, and like we said earlier, not many of older adults necessarily um, have that technology available to them. So uh, we had to get creative. And um, as with other assisted livings and um, nursing homes across the country, we also started um, setting up window visits so that family members uh, could talk to their loved one, um, you know, separated by a window, um, talking on the phone or cell phone to each other through the glass. And that was done in their uh, apartment or their room or in a common area. And um, those have been some very um, touching uh, moments that we've observed as as people are are communicating in that fashion. Um, we've also encouraged you know old-fashioned letter writing um, on both sides from the resident to their family and family to the residents and then the staff members can uh, sit down one-on-one -on -one and and read those to them. Um, we also came up with a campaign called Cheer Mail and a cheer mail is an effort to encourage everyone, not just family, but the greater community to, to send in uh, messages of hope and inspiration uh, to the residents in our congregate settings. And that can be um, you know, through an email. Um, it could be even a, um, a short video, pre-recorded video that um, they wanna say a certain, uh, send a certain message and we'll make sure that it's getting to uh, the resident, whether we um, print out the email and read it to them or, you know, take that pre-recorded video and show that to them on one of, of our um, devices offline. Uh, so that is something that we are promoting uh, throughout all of our senior living communities so that uh, the community can get more deeply involved in in supporting our, our older adults in uh, senior living communities. Um, another thing is we've also encouraged uh, people to, family members to drop off uh, photo albums. Um, photo albums, you know, are full of memories and those are great conversation starters. So if they can drop off a, a photo album, um, one they already had, or they can put one together, um, our staff is, you know, more than happy to uh, spend that time with our residents and and relive some of those great memories with their favorite people. And a few other things that we've said to families is, um, you know, and trying to be creative is, you know, bring a, a, a favorite memento from home or something that really, uh, an item that uh, reflects a memory or a time in the past that uh, just says that we love you. Um, you know, anything that says love or um, that we love you and we're thinking about you uh, can be dropped off and shared with our residents. Um, even their favorite baked good or their favorite meal can be delivered and uh, those memories are, are there in those, in those items. So 
So those are some of the things that we've been able to come up with. Well, I love hearing that, uh, Aaron. Thank you so much for uh, answering that. And really, I want to thank uh, just this amazing panel. It's been a, part, a privilege to be a part of it. Um, what I want to do is have a little bit of time left to really reach out to all of you for uh, uh, just an answer from each of you of the advice you would give. We've got a lot of viewers of all ages out there right now, whether it be online or over broadcast. And they would like to hear from you about if they're feeling isolated, what piece of advice would you give to them? Take, uh, take about a minute and tell us what advice you would give. And we'll just kind of go through our entire panel. Aaron, I know you just finished, but I'm going to start with you. Uh, if you had uh, a piece of advice for our viewers of any age that might be feeling isolated, what advice would you give them? Right. I think I would say when, or at least this is something that I've learned for myself, is when someone says to you, how can I help you? Um, instead of saying, oh, I don't need anything, I'm fine, you know, really think about that question because um, it gives purpose. And it, there may be something little, uh, you know, I couldn't buy Kleenex or I couldn't buy my favorite kind of rice up at the grocery store this week, I couldn't find it. Uh, when you're out next, will you look for some and, and you know, pay back? Or, um, you know, when they say, how can I help? Say something like, oh, what's the that's a good book you've read recently. Can you loan it to me? Um, and, and even though you may not get to visit uh, very much or have that little interaction, if something is dropped off to you, it's that, um, it's that idea of, of the next step, the idea of the, the hope of connecting again. That's perfect, Aaron. Uh, and Aaron is joining us from uh, the Volunteers from America for Colorado. Let's go to Christine Burroughs. She's our Director of Older Adult Services at Easter Seals of Colorado. Christine, your advice for anybody out there of all ages dealing with isolation right now? I think just taking advantage of the time that we have. Um, I've been able to connect with people who I haven't connected with in a long time just because of, um, you know, no one's doing anything. We're all at home. So, you know, being able to take advantage of Zoom calls and happy hours and things like that. Um, another thing I have been take, trying to take advantage of is um, my neighbors around me. So walking the dog, I, I, our neighborhood is very friendly and, and community oriented. But now during this time when we're out walking the dogs, everyone is, is talking to each other. Hi, how are you? How are you doing? You, you know, have a great day. And, and the big waves instead of just the little, the little smiles and the, the small waves. So taking advantage of those opportunities to build those connections while we have the time to do it, I think is really important. The big waves. I could not uh, uh, echo that further. There, it's something about going on a walk with a big wave uh, just makes a big difference. Christine, great point. Uh, Aaliyah Cook, our sophomore from Emory University, your advice for folks of all ages if they're facing isolation this time? Well, I would say continue reaching out to your old friends. Uh, you'd be surprised who'd really just like to have a nice chat on the phone right now. Uh, continue being creative with ways to connect with people, even if it's not physically. Uh, getting creative with ways that you can really spend time with people and really still speak with people. And also remember that this is temporary and we will one day be able to see our friends and family again and you are helping vulnerable people by staying in your home. Uh, very wise words. You're doing Emory, Emory University. Very proud. Uh, let's go to Perla Gaylor. Perla, uh, you're the director of the Denver Office on Aging. Tell us your advice for folks of all ages uh, facing isolation right now. Well, I think there's so much that we can learn from each other and, um, you know, just opening up yourself to learning something new, um, whether it's reaching out and going online and trying a new uh, book online or uh, playing a game or, uh, you know, whatever that looks like to you. I think just getting out of your comfort zone and really trying to um, be present and, and try something new. So, um I know that might be hard for some uh, people who maybe don't have access to online or, uh, you know, just trying to find something new to do and, um, and reaching out to others and being present. I think that's really uh, important for not just yourself, but for others. I think that's great advice. I have a colleague who's actually learning some of the, using some of this downtime to uh, learn how to play the piano. Uh, and that's pretty daunting, but I think it's great because it's stretching the brain every mm -hmm. time from, uh, from my four-year-old nephew uh, to my 84-year-old uncle, um, everyone would uh, enjoys and is healthy for them to stretch their brain. So great advice. 
Uh, Stephanie Knight, you're the executive director at the Senior Hub. Tell us your advice for our viewers who might be facing isolation from any age. I think I would just follow up with a lot of things that have already been said by other panelists. I mean, it's definitely important during this time, we're all kind of in a very collective shared experience. And I think it's important that we share that vulnerability as well. And we, we raise our hand and we say what we're needing. I know that in our office and through our networks, we get everything from calls from toilet paper to maybe gardening tips or things that can be helped with in your everyday life. And I also really applaud Christine for what she said when she is out or when she's able to and don her door or talk to her neighbor, she waves big. And I do the same thing when I'm out in the grocery store getting an essential item mask on. I tend to talk up a little bit louder and I have more conversation because I think we're all, we're not able to smile at each other. We're missing conversation and connection and we can still kind of talk through our masks and acknowledge everybody. So I think it's important to just find any small way we can to connect and also show appreciation to others. Appreciation feels good to the giver and the receiver. So any way that you can reach out to an essential worker, someone in healthcare, someone in a nonprofit or community work that you know that you may have not called. I, I started just calling routinely nurses and you know care workers that I knew from my work and from my peer group and just asking them how they're doing. So you know that, that feels good and that's another way to connect through appreciation and concern and love and respect for this time. So I just think we need to do more of that, and I'm so encouraged about how we are reaching across community. I think, unlike any time that I've worked in nonprofit, I see a lot of the silos coming down, and we really are reaching across community to meet the need at large for everyone, no matter what the age, background, or you know, setting that they're in. So that's exciting and encouraging to me. Bob Murphy, let's go to you, our Colorado State Director of AARP. Your advice for our viewers of all ages. Dominic, you know, at AARP, we've done a lot of research into this subject of loneliness, and one very simple metric is that you are twice as likely to be lonely, to feel lonely, if you don't talk to a neighbor. So my advice, and this is supported by some of the mental health experts we've had on some of our virtual program uh, programming, is turn off the bad news, the TV, the radio, the laptop, the phone, and get out and take a walk. Get out and, and say hi to a neighbor from an appropriate physical distance, of course. Uh, Bob, great advice. I completely agree. I've established much better. Oh, I, I feel good about having great neighbors, but it, 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 nowadays it's uh, even more important. It's a great, great advice. Let's go to Phil Nash, our executive director of Boomers Leading Change. Phil, your advice for our viewers of all ages. Well, I am a great believer in the power of gratitude. Uh, this is a time when a lot of us are feeling a lot of loss. Uh, but I always try to remind myself that no matter how much I have lost, other people never had that to begin with. Uh, there are people who have uh, grown up in isolation or experienced isolation as just a way of life. Uh, I have been at other times in my life even more isolated because I felt distant from the people I really wanted to be around. So I think every day, uh, think, of, uh, think of something that you're grateful for and uh, the list will grow much longer every time you think of that, rather than feeling sorry for ourselves. And one other thing I would say too, I mean, we put on masks when we go out in public uh, to the grocery stores or to walk in the park. Um, we have to figure out different ways of smiling at each other because that's such a powerful expression of connection between people. So if it's you, you know how to smile with your eyes or give a thumbs up or, or some way of letting people in your environment know that you recognize them and you support them uh, in that very small but meaningful way. I feel I couldn't agree more. I almost want to get a mask with a big smile on because that's one of the <laughs> things I miss most. James Roy II, let's go to you, our executive director of, the, of Park Hill Collective Impact. Your advice. Yeah, yeah, I really love what everyone has said uh, already. It uh, makes my heart warm, especially, uh, Phil, thank you for saying smile with your eyes. That's something that reminds me of um, America's top model <laughs> and what Tyra Banks used to say on that. Um, anyway, <laughs> back to the point. Uh, I really, you know, I think this is a really great time to, to, uh, to show those expressions of love from a distance and like the big waves, the big smiles and, and uh, making sure that you, you know that, there is that gratitude that was also mentioned before. 
but the, the piece that I really want to uh, put in there and is, is if technology is the only way uh, to connect with the ones that you love, don't shy away from it. We've got, uh, we're at a unique space in, in, in history and time that allows us to connect with someone around the world face to face uh, with our phones or, or uh, computers and to not completely shy away with it or from it, but to uh, utilize it to bolster the uh, social connections that we are uh, creating in person as well. Great tips. Let's finish up with Sylvia Solis, evaluator and focus group facilitator with Joining Vision and Action. Sylvia, your advice. Yeah, so I would say open up. So going back to our earlier conversation around loneliness and social media and to use the analogy or metaphor with the masks, I think in our, you know, just the culture that we live in, I think we're used to wearing masks, not physically, but just emotionally, you know, when we talk even with coworkers or neighbors, like we, you know, someone else brought up before. I think this is a great opportunity to practice some vulnerability. So I think people will be greatly benefited from learning or realizing that, you know, you're not alone. You know, someone else may be experiencing a similar kind of fear and, and pain and even joy and, and hope. And as we open up, I think the opportunity to really connect uh, becomes possible. And I think um, as you hear from others, empathy is also cultivated. I mean, identifying someone else or other people who may be feeling isolated and lonely and scared and, and join them in, in their experience, you know, go through the difficult and the good emotions together. That would be my advice. Great advice by all. This has been an absolute honor to host this panel and be with you. Thank you so much. I want to thank all of you on a wonderful panel for joining us today for On the Same Page. If you'd like to watch this show online, please go to pbs12.org. If you have a question or would like more information, please go to changingthenarrativeco.org or leave us a message at 303-991-5027. Please check out our next discussion on Friday, June 12th at 7 p.m. right here on PBS 12. For everybody here at On the Same Page, I'm Dominic Dizzuti. Thank you so much for watching. Good night.